ಸಮುದ್ರವಸನೀ ದೇವಿ ಪರ್ವತಸ್ತನ ಮಂಡಲೆ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪತ್ನೈ ನಮಸ್ತುಭ್ಯಂ ಪಾದಸ್ಪರ್ಶ ಕ್ಷಮಸ್ವೀ ದೋಸ್ ಹು ಡೇರ್ ಟು ಫ್ಲೈ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಕೇರ್ ಟು ಲೀವ್ ದೇರ್ ಫುಟ್ ಪ್ರಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಹೈಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಎಫ್ ವಿ ಎಸ್ Hey, good morning everybody are you able to see my slide and hear me yes sir okay great okay in today's class uh, we will complete uh, what we started uh, with uh, revisiting the materials in the last class we just looked at the aluminum alloys in the previous class uh, today's class we will look at uh titanium alloys and steel uh, before venturing into composites uh, in little more detail than what we have done before um we will also look at uh, an introduction to the uh, state of the art uh, uh, in terms of light vehicle structures um uh, probably a week or two later i'll also uh, give uh, the final results for this state of the art so that you know uh, where we are heading towards uh, in between we'd be covering as i said uh, last week uh, we would would be covering the theory of elasticity uh, only those aspects which would stay with us rather than uh, the strength of materials aspects many of which are not used uh, anymore or um, uh, uh, more accurate uh, options are available without having to spend too much of a computational effort so let's get going then uh, before that i'd probably uh, um, like to uh showcase that these two aircraft that i've been um, using as demo models um, in the uh, previous see the engine came out it's a single engine now okay i'll probably uh, put this later but um yes so this is the uh, airbus uh, a350 which i've been using to demonstrate the composite uh, materials and the um, airbus um, a320 a330 uh, dash 200 which i've been using to uh, demonstrate the typical metallic structures um, of course both have metals and composites but this uh, uh, bigger amount of uh, composites in the 350 compared to the 330 uh, both of these are um, uh, one is to 400 scale models um i'll also uh, show you two more models i just want you to uh, any of you to guess uh what those models uh, could be they are also one is to 400 scale models um just in comparison of the size and also in terms of um uh, the other aspects i would like you to uh, uh just guess and tell me what you think those uh, other aircraft are um i don't know if i can actually cover that and show okay um yeah so what do you think uh, this aircraft is any 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 guesses anybody you have seen Beluga. Yes, very good. Uh so you see this is also one is to 400 scale and uh, what what is the beluga used for? Uh, for transportation, cargo transportation. Excellent. Yeah. Uh cargo transportation in particular they use it a lot to transport the components of uh, aircraft uh before they are uh, finally assembled um, usually in Toulouse. So uh this particular aircraft if you see even though it is for one is to 400 scale and it could be used to assemble the parts of the Airbus A350 it's actually much smaller than the Airbus A350 which shows that um actually in reality uh 
uh, it's not uh, the entire aircraft which is made at a single location they are made components are made all across the world uh, many different parts of the world and eventually they're all brought together at a particular place uh, for the final assembly uh, that is done they could also be uh, part assemblies in between uh, before it is finally done so um, all of those parts can actually fit into the beluga but not the entire aircraft so that is an important thing and um, I don't know if I'll be able to cover anyway. So let me not uh, use it for guessing because I can't cover. Okay, maybe I can. So what do you think uh, this aircraft is? An another Airbus aircraft, uh, but um, again, one is to 400 scale compared to the Airbus A350. Um, so if, if this is also one is to 400 and it's a much larger aircraft, uh, again, from Airbus, what do you think this is? A380. Very good, yeah. So the A380, so that's why I was just tilting it because it's written on the wing tail, uh, the vertical tail as well as on the fuselage body. Um, now the A380 and A350 are kind of um, much more recent uh, compared to the others. A380, of course, the production unfortunately has stopped, but uh, it was uh, the largest um, uh, commercial transport aircraft that was ever uh, made. And um, so some of the technologies associated with that are very critical too. The reason why I brought the um, Beluga and the um, Airbus A380 is to showcase especially uh, one of the materials that we'll be uh, looking at today that is steel um, which though uh, very heavy because remember in the very first class um, I asked uh, some of you who with a civil engineering background why some of the civil engineering materials are not used in um, the uh, first of all the difference between civil engineering structures and the aerospace structures and uh, in terms of the specific specific in terms of materials when we started talking uh, why steel um, uh, or concrete is not used but in reality yes steel uh, certain uh, kinds of steel are uh, used uh, very much in aircraft and in particular in the uh, landing gears that you see over here um, because in terms of absolute values of stiffness and strength uh, we require certain requirements which are not provided even by uh, composites and uh, eventually we have to depend on steel and for a few other uh, reasons as well so uh, in order to showcase that I, um, I just thought of bringing this uh, uh, and um, the other uh, distinguishing feature uh, is in terms of propulsion what, what do you think uh, in terms of the beluga and the other two aircraft that i've been showing in the previous classes uh, compared to them um, uh, the airbus a380 in terms of propulsion has a very uh, a different feature what is that you can actually see Come again? Number of engines. Yes, number of engines. So you have four engines over here, uh, obviously because of the size of the aircraft. Uh, first of all, you, in a transport aircraft, you're supposed to have uh, at least two. Um, and uh, here you have four. Uh, and um, this again, as I said um, in an earlier um, uh, demo, that um, it helps in terms of the stress relief as well, because you see that the uh, other two engines uh, compared to let's, uh, let's bring uh, back A350. Uh, because I dropped one engine for the A350. So let me show the A330. Uh, so if you look at um, uh, the inner two engines, they are as close to the uh, fuselage as in the, uh, almost as in the Airbus A350. The other two are the ones which have gone outboard. The new two engines that have been introduced have uh, gone much outboard. And that's going to bring a lot of relief as far as the um, uh, lift distributions, bending moment is concerned, because that's self weight from the engines and also in terms of the um, uh, thrust uh, for the drag uh, uh, bending moment stress relief but as I said that is going to be a, of much less concern so uh, these are some important factors the other thing is of course in terms of the where you store the fuel which we talked about in a little more detail and where it needs to be supplied uh, for this particular engine being much closer so um, that way uh, the amount of effort in terms of the number number of uh, um, the fuel supply lines etc uh, are much uh, reduced if you, uh, for the um, uh, lift bending moment distribution uh, stress relief you want to have more of the fuel uh, outboard so then um, uh, the supply uh, lines uh, to the outboard engines are uh, much uh, shorter in length as well so there are many uh, different interesting aspects that you can actually observe 
then coming to uh, the landing gear itself because that's again uh, something we uh, talked about um, you can again see uh, in between uh, these two uh, uh, what do you see in terms of the landing gear differences Very good, yeah. So obviously you're having a larger aircraft uh, which is much heavier. So the loads are going to be coming when the aircraft is landing, um, also during takeoff, but the landing is much more severe. So what you're basically looking at is uh, the ability of the um, landing gear system to take that. And so you see many more uh, landing gears as Simon Wai rightly pointed out. Um, uh, so once again, it's uh, a tricycle kind of a landing gear. So you have a nose and then the main landing gears, but the main landing gears is now split uh, into many more. Uh, and uh, some of them are coming on the fuselage. Uh, so you see that um, in the other case, it was uh, both on the wings. Uh, whereas uh, you still have those two on the wings. In addition, you have um, two more sets of landing gears which are coming on to the uh, uh, to the fuselage belly as well and again if you look at in terms of the number of wheels per uh, landing gear unit uh, you also see that here there are just four four in each um, main landing gear uh, whereas here you see six again uh, you see these differences um, even when you're driving on a national highway in terms of the trucks very large trucks which go and the number of wheels that they have um, uh, uh, and at each wheel the number of tires that are involved so you see that um, uh, uh, these differences have to be made uh, account for when you're going for larger and larger aircraft so uh, you would see some kind of a similar situation when you're going from fighter kind of aircraft configurations to bomber kind of configuration so if the uh, bomber has a lot more ammunition then um, it's typically much larger and heavier and therefore you would see the differences in terms of the engine distributions landing gear distributions etc so uh, let's start off with um, what we were um, uh, just hinting upon in the uh, uh, in this particular discussion in terms of where the steels go. Um, uh, it's basically places where you have uh, very heavy stresses and uh, uh, you uh, are willing to compromise on the weight a little bit um, just for the uh, absolute uh, sense. But uh, these are not uh, the dominant um, weight fractions of the entire ex structural weight and therefore you are willing to live with that uh, at least as of now. Uh, the other advantage of uh, going for steel as opposed to aluminium alloy, of course, is in terms of the overall cost. It's one sixth of the cost. Um, but again, we are talking about uh, just the material cost. We have to talk about the uh, lifetime cost as we uh, talked about earlier. And there are certain aspects associated with that. We'll see. Uh, amongst the three uh, metallic materials, if you look at only the density uh, aspect, it's uh, clear that uh, uh, the steel density is much more than the aluminium and the uh, titanium density and we have seen that. Um, the other aspect is um, uh, what uh, actually exhibits itself in terms of a life cycle cost uh, is the uh, poor por uh, corrosion resistance that steel has um, compared to aluminium alloys. For example, the aluminium alloy, uh, the um, advantage is, as I said, the aluminium oxide which forms and um, uh, as long as the, that particular component is not under uh, tensile fatigue, uh, that aluminium uh, oxide actually kind of um, uh, takes care of uh, the further corrosion. And sometimes also pure aluminium is used to uh, coat as well. And there are many other kinds of coatings that are used. Uh, uh, in the case of steel, on the other hand, uh, you would have plating rather than coating. And um, so in other words, the, uh, the thickness is a little more substantial and the components are typically plated. And um, also, as I said, it's used only where um, very high strengths are required, uh, both in terms of yielding, so you, because dimensionality is very important, uh, so uh, and uh, the ultimate tensile strength, because uh, eventual failure uh, also has to be avoided as far as possible. And um, these landing gears are taking uh, very large. 
um, impact load. So the energy absorption capabilities, uh, though of course you have a dampener and the damping system, etc. We are not going to the landing edge uh, design itself, which is uh, uh, much more than just a pure structural design. There's a lot of um, uh, servo dynamics that is involved in terms of the uh, 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 the hydraulics that are uh, there in the uh, landing gear system as well. So. Uh, the examples, as I said, in, ad in addition to the landing gear units are also the highly loaded fittings. Um, so where you have, uh, for example, rivets and uh, bolts, etc. These are also highly loaded because um, the two, two components which are attached through a bolt or a rivet uh, are undergoing tensile load and or compressive loads which is causing a shear um, within the shank of the uh, bolt or the rivet and uh, that could be very large and so these are highly loaded fittings typically though they share the load amongst many different uh, many uh, number of um, uh, those joint those fittings uh, still uh, each of them uh, uh, has a substantial load and therefore you would not uh, be going for an aluminium bolt aluminium rivet in most situations you would be uh, typically going for the steel ones Continuing with steels, uh, specific uh, types of steels, uh, the AI SI4340 is something which is uh, used in power transmission uh, gear shafts. Um, so the uh, power needs to be transmitted, um, for example, uh, from the aircraft engine where it is generated to um, the various uh, electrical systems, lighting systems, etc. Eventually, so you have the uh, transmissions, um, uh, more so in helicopter where uh, the main rotor is generating uh, the uh, lift uh, whereas the tail rotor is generating the anti-torque and both of these have to be fed from uh, the uh, turbo shaft engines that are used in um, uh, helicopters so uh, there's a, a gearing system or the power transmission shafts that are involved uh, with a main gearbox and a tail gearbox and between these there because the rotation speeds are different etc and um, the, uh, through the tail boom uh, which is fairly long you have a transmission shaft so many of these uh, cases um, at least in the traditional designs larger uh, engines uh, larger helicopters you have uh, AISI 4340 which is used uh, uh, for example in some of the Russian helicopters the power transmission uh, gear shafts uh, are typically uh, made using uh, this uh, then the other um, kind is the 300m uh, which is uh, in in essence very similar to the ISI 4340 in terms of the combination and the the uh, processes which are used uh, but it's uh, the slight modifications are to get a higher strength so typically in steel you are having um, uh, primarily iron as you know and uh, carbon is introduced for strength but the more the carbon you introduce the more the strength you get but uh, up to a certain limit of course but uh, you also end up with uh, material which is a little more brittle and um, so you may not be able to absorb uh, much energy so it's again uh, trade-off the design trade-offs examples of which we saw in the previous uh, class as well uh, so for uh, in situations where strength is the dominant requirement for uh, particular structures uh, structural components design then you uh, end up using the 300m rather than the aisi uh, 4340 um, so to avoid some of the problems that carbon has uh, brought in uh, somewhere I think in the early 60s um, uh, the concept of maraging steel came up where you try to avoid carbon as, as far as possible in fact uh, many of them have less than one percent uh, maraging steels where you introduce instead uh, nickel cobalt and um, a few molybdenum manganese etc in substantial amounts uh, all of these might add up to almost around like 20 percent or so order of magnitude is what i'm talking about so these maraging steels to some extent uh, overcame uh, some of the issues with uh, carbon uh, materials but um, again you had uh, uh, some of the other issues still uh, pending uh, so uh, the 300m has higher strength uh, and therefore it's commonly used for the landing gear components um, so you can look at the uh, values of these absolute strengths in terms of the tensile 
strength it's about uh, 1900 megapascals and the yielding strength about 1500 megapascals which in absolute terms is uh, much larger than uh, what most other materials can uh, provide uh, still of course uh, the density is very large so in terms of the specific strength it is low but um, what is uh, the guiding factor here um, is the uh, absolute strength uh, both uh, yielding as well as tensile yielding because you do not want uh, too much of uh, dimensionality change uh, did somebody have a question uh, yes in the landing gears also right right that's correct uh, the 300 m the 300 m is uh, used more in the landing gear because there the strength requirements are even higher than in the transmission shafts and the fittings yes, sir. so the transmission yes, shafts and fitting will uh, more often be using uh, the 4340 um, or similar kinds, uh, similar class of uh, steels, whereas the 300M and other similar class of steels will be used more in the uh, landing gear uh, where, where the dimensionality and strength requirements are even higher. Yes, Saman Bhai? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So it was not a question, I just wanted to clarify. Okay, yeah. So that's um, as far as we look at steels, uh, we'll visit it a little more maybe later on in contextual basis. Um, okay, I don't know why the right side came up before the left side. Um, so uh, the titanium alloys is what we would look at next, um, as, which falls somewhere in between the steels and the, um, the aluminium alloys. And uh, of course, are very expensive, uh, even more expensive than the aluminium alloys, the most expensive of all the three. So you use it only where it is required. Uh, it's surprising that titanium alloys should be so expensive because um, titanium dioxide is one of the uh, very commonly available materials um, uh, on Earth. Uh, but the problem is in terms of uh, removing those uh, atoms of oxygen uh, moving from titanium dioxide to uh, the titanium where the issue actually typically occurs. And um, uh, for a long time, uh, that was a um, uh, very, very difficult process. Uh, the Russians had mastered it to a large extent. Uh, and uh, the Americans used a very um, indirect means to obtain that uh, for some of their uh, even military aircraft uh, until the Russians eventually found out and cut the supplies. Um, but uh, the titanium dioxide itself is used pretty much in uh, most materials that we use even on a day to day uh, basis because the white pigment for most materials even like your um, uh, coffee mugs and things like that, the ceramics, uh, many of them the whitening um, agent is typically titanium uh, dioxide. Uh, so even many of your bathroom fittings, uh, kitchen fittings, etc. Uh, many of these things actually are made out of uh, titanium dioxide. So um, it's that process of getting the titanium and then the titanium alloy, um, which is kind of difficult. And also once that titanium alloy is there, uh, the manufacturing process, etc. So we'll see certain aspects of that. But the most common titanium alloy which is used is um, one with aluminum and the vanadium the six and the v six and the four there indicate the weight percentage of those alloying elements so the main element of course remains titanium but uh, aluminium vanadium and a few other even smaller quantities of other materials could, could be used over here um, so as i said in terms of density also it's somewhere in between the steel and the aluminium alloy uh, lighter than steel and heavier than the aluminium alloy and uh, in terms of the ultimate tensile strength and yield strength, again, it's somewhere in between. Uh, and it's typically uh, um, almost double that of the um, strongest um, uh, aluminum alloy that we looked at in the previous class, namely the aluminum 7075 with a heat treatment process of T6. Um, so, uh, of course, it's still uh, smaller compared to that of uh, steel, but um, uh, in places where uh, the specific strength is very uh, important uh, you would uh, go for this rather than the aluminium 7075 and uh, uh, the other important thing is um, in terms of the temperature requirements it can be used continuously up to uh, 535 degrees centigrade uh, so that entire range uh, that you see and uh, also the corrosion resistance is superior both to steel and aluminium alloy. So those locations where higher temperatures um, are encountered and or uh, corrosive environments are uh, encountered, the titanium alloys uh, find a much uh, bigger uh, role. Uh, 
um, so it's not only in making uh, getting the titanium but also in terms of the making the titanium part um, there is a difficulty especially in machining uh, which means the part cost first of all the material cost is higher uh, because of the process going from titanium dioxide to titanium but then after the titanium is there using that titanium to ma uh, make certain parts machining the part cost is as much as five to ten times that of uh, typical aluminium alloy uh, part uh, the same part made out of aluminium alloy so that um, uh, manufacturability in terms of the costs involved there uh, again titanium there is a, a sacrifice that you have to do but if the corrosion and the um, high temperature requirement requirements um, are uh, there then you are willing to pay that additional cost uh, both in terms of the material as well as its uh, manufacturing but uh, uh, technology uh, continuously improves so there are um, what is known as newer manufacturing technologies relatively speaking because even this has been around for decades uh, is the near net shape uh, forming so you form that uh, component um, in almost as close to the actual end uh, shape that you want so that actual machining is not required uh, so therefore uh, there's no surface finish which is required as well uh, because it's so good in corrosion so you don't need a plating like in steel or a coating as in aluminium um, so therefore um, uh, no surface finish is required so there are uh, certain advantages you have in terms of the costing there as well if you are uh, intelligently adapt your manufacturing uh, processes so the part manufacturing has become uh, relatively uh, more economic compared to a machined titanium part but still um, compared to aluminium parts uh, the overall cost of the manufacturing is still high uh, so despite these uh, this larger cost um, you find it uh, increasingly used uh, uh, not now but uh, over a few decades now um, in military aircraft uh, where uh, you are having um, them uh, flying at supersonic speeds so that uh, 1 plus m squared by 5 heating factor that we saw for the temperature in the previous one of the previous classes uh, that play plays a role there and so f15 uh, for example uses um, a large amount uh, uh, almost 26 percent uh, but sr 71 um, uh, blackbird i think it's called uh, um, it, it uses even more so uh, of the uh, titanium alloys uh, especially in uh, regions close to the engine uh, where uh, the heat is uh, much more of a concern but also in these supersonic aircrafts the leading edges etc uh, in many situations uh, can uh, reach very high temperatures because there are stagnation points over there and therefore almost the stagnation temperature Temperature is what is encountered over there. So um, then coming to composites, um, uh, we we'll look at the modeling aspects uh, because we have already looked at the why aspect, the what aspect, the where aspect and how aspect. So the how aspect is about the modeling, which we just um, looked at very superficially in terms of the micro mechanics and the macro mechanics. Um, so we have uh, in detail answered not only why composites, but also why the specific components of the composite, namely the why fiber and why uh, matrix quest. Um, and uh, what they essentially are the examples of that etc and where they typically are used etc we answered many of those questions but uh, the details of that how uh, we only touched upon uh, the very basic aspects of the micro mechanics and macro mechanics um, the, that we had and there is also another course uh, called analysis and design of composites um, uh, which is offered in IAC by Dr. Narayan Naik in the aerospace department uh, where you go uh, a little more detail into the uh, the modeling of the composites and also some of the manufacturing uh, aspects so the details of how uh, can however be answered only after uh, we uh, understand the prerequisites of um, the uh, theory of elasticity so at least the basic concepts uh, many of you are already aware of it but um, we'll look at it um, at least from uh, a preliminary point of view especially for those of you who are uh, not going to stay with structures uh, so you need to be exposed to at least some of these basic aspects of the uh, theory of elasticity because we are assuming the material to be elastic which is the case uh, for most components until um, the yield sets in for the metals and uh, almost until failure for the composites.
So um, let's uh, recollect some of the aspects of how to model the composites in terms of the assumptions. Um, we will not look into those assumptions which um, are um, valid assumptions uh, like uh, for example uh, we said that uh, the stress depends only on the strain. Uh, they, uh, then we said that uh, the stress and the strain are both symmetric and then we brought in the Hookean elasticity generalized a sense that uh, it's a linear elasticity etc. So uh, this the very many aspects that we uh, looked at but uh, what are the uh, problematic assumptions that we had identified earlier as um, either irrelevant or unnecessary and uh, it is those that uh, we will try to do away with the state of the art so what are those um, one is the plane stress uh, state uh, we know that uh, thin structures which are loaded either only in plane or even out of plane but um, that bending is going to cause essentially in plane stress the the um, uh, the hoop stress is also for example in a due to the internal pressurization of the fuselage the hoop stress the beluga probably doesn't need much of an internal pressurization because it's a cargo aircraft but an airbus a380 on the other hand uh, will require um, uh, uh, for substantial internal pressurization uh, load which is causing uh, hoop uh, stress so uh, but essentially for that shell uh, even though the load itself is in the radial direction uh, which is out of plane uh, the uh, stress itself predominantly is the hoop stress and uh, half almost approximately half of that the longitudinal stress uh, which are a, a factor of the cross-sectional dimension to thickness ratio uh, by that factor it gets amplified the pressure uh, to uh, to see what the hoop stress is uh, so that uh, particular uh, feature made a plane stress uh, an attractive assumption in the initial stages but um, uh, we know that many uh, things cannot be explained with that especially in composites such as delamination uh, we have described that qualitatively earlier so how do we go about uh, moving suppose you have made a plane stress approximation but later you encounter a delamination how do you come back using that plane stress results to uh, probably get an estimate of the out of plane stresses so the entire analysis might have been done with plane stress uh, saying that sigma i3 equal to approximately zero uh, where three is the thickness direction as shown in this particular uh, sketch over here z direction being along the thickness and um, uh, so we we could be doing that saying that all the uh, sigma xz sigma yz and sigma zz are zero but eventually we can actually use sigma xx sigma yy uh, and sigma xy which are the only three um, uh, stresses allowed in a plane stress approximation using the 3d equilibrium equations so uh, some of you might be familiar with the 3d equilibrium equations as uh, partial differential equations involving derivatives of the stress um, uh, components with uh, and uh, relating them uh, to the body force per unit volume uh, so using those uh, stress uh, 3d stress equilibrium equations we can actually work backwards and uh, uh, after having determined all the plane stress uh, state distribution sigma xx how uh, it varies with x and y and with z similarly um, sigma y y and sigma x y once you find that variation now you know those particular stresses you do not still know the other three uh, stresses sigma xz yz and zz so you use those three uh, equilibrium equations and integrate with respect to z in order to get the stress distributions um, the which are out of plane that is the through the thickness stresses and with that you go back and uh, compare with the interlaminar strengths that is how much of strength uh, can it take uh, in terms of a sigma 3 3 or sigma zz before two layers separate and then you uh, arrive at uh, that um, uh, how much of uh, factor of safety or uh, margin of safety that you have the other assumption uh, so so that's the way you overcome that plane stress uh, state even if you have originally assumed a plane stress state and then of course um, a fallout of the plane stress state is the next assumption that you make in terms of a kirchhoff law assumption in terms of assuming um, either the displacement field or the strain field and uh, which of course reflects on the stress field or it could be the other way around you start with an assumption on the stress field and it um, has an impact on the uh, strain field and the displacement field so in such situations 
situations you have um, uh, the in-plane strain uh, which Kirchhoff and Love assumed to be linear through the uh, laminate thickness uh, so that it breaks into two parts one is the curvature the other is the in-plane strain or the mid-plane reference strain and uh, then you use those two to uh, assemble the overall strain at any uh, point in the uh, away from the uh, reference surface as well linearly with respect to the thickness that uh, coefficient of linearity depending upon the curvatures both bending curvatures and the twisting curvatures uh, so the other uh, thing is the displacement field might be assumed over and above the kirchhoff love assumption um, we will see uh, some examples of that uh, as we go forward in the next uh, week um, so uh, especially in the thickness direction whether it is uh, constant with respect to the thickness some of the uh, displacement measures and some of the displacement measures which are um, uh, linear with respect to the thickness but uh, usually not uh, beyond that for the simple models uh, but uh, people have made a living as I said uh, going for quadratic cubic etc both in the displacement field as well as the stress field unnecessary uh, so the stress field assumptions uh, is the next thing which people make as if um, saying that it's a much better thing uh, than a displacement field assumption but uh, essentially uh, 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 it's boiling down to the same thing uh, you don't know something you rather admit that you don't know instead of assuming it and then uh, making a mess out of it uh, it might work in a few cases that's why these are called as ad hoc assumptions um, whereas in uh, general it will not work and finally uh, removing the very need for the um, empirical uh, corrections uh, like uh, an example of which is the uh, shear correction that we do typically uh, in a Timoshenko like model for beams and um, in a Reisner Mindlin like model for uh, plates and shells so how do we um, uh, come up with a model where such uh, empirical corrections are no longer needed uh, is what the state of the art uh, looks at So, um, in today's class, I'll only uh, talk about it in words, uh, but um, in one of the later classes, probably next week or um, the week after that, uh, the, uh, before we wind up this course, uh, well before your exams, uh, we will um, talk about the actual equations which are associated with that without deriving them, but giving the final results, but putting them in that bigger picture of um, load versus stress versus strain versus displacement, load and stress. Uh, uh, related by equilibrium equations, stress and strain with the constitutive law, the strain and the displacement with the um, kinematics. Uh, and so how they look uh, when you use this state of the art at the end of all of the derivations, how they look, uh, how compact they are. And um, uh, they're geometrically exact and uh, give absolutely accurate re re uh, results um, with a huge computational efficiency. And so why um, uh, I've been repeatedly saying that these uh, simplistic strength of materials formula are actually not necessary because uh, you're not getting too much of an advantage of them. Uh, yes, uh, they're like uh, things that you can work out even on a, a tissue paper uh, at the back of an envelope kind of a calculation but uh, uh, what is what use is it if it's not it's going to be so way off from uh, reality uh, so uh, there's uh, there's no need to go for that level of computational efficiency with the kind of computers uh, that we have today uh, so uh, even even uh, let's say onboard computers for health monitoring systems etc so computational efficiency is important but it should not be at the sacrifice of accuracy to that extent so that's basically what uh, um, uh, this particular methodology do, do, does away with. Um, I say macro mechanics here, but um, this methodology has been used with uh, micro mechanics as well. Uh, some of your teaching assistants like Renuka are uh, dealing with that micro mechanics uh, aspects uh, using the same methodology. Um, and we've got uh, really good success uh, in uh, uh, doing uh, similar things with micro mechanics as well. But it started off as something that uh, people wanted to do with macro mechanics in particular uh, shell theory and beam theory uh, so what we look at here uh, is a very powerful mathematical technique uh, to solve variational problems. So what are variational problems? Um, uh, the reason why we introduce the strain energy with so much of an emphasis is that 
uh, one it's a scalar quantity where you do not need to worry about directions um, and uh, complicated tensorial notations etc which puts off a lot of people uh, in the theory of elasticity uh, done with vectors or tensorial calculus yes they are very elegant methodologies in a, uh, to look at in very compact way but um, there's an alternate methodology through variational principles when we try to look at we are dealing with a scalar quantity the energy or uh, the total potential um, things like Hamiltonian principle etc that um, you might have uh, looked at uh, in your uh, schools as well as uh, college uh, in a in a simplest simplified way but there are advanced versions of that uh, which basically essentially are variational principles wherein uh, a branch of mathematics called the calculus of variation um, is taken into account and that calculus of variation um, helps you to do calculus of functions of functions so in calculus you're dealing with functions you're dealing with derivatives of those functions um, you're dealing with derivatives of unknown functions and trying to determine them by solving differential equations they may be ordinary or partial differential equations linear or non-linear homogeneous or non-homogeneous um, constant coefficient or with uh, coefficients which are varying as well uh, so whatever they are essentially uh, they are actually fallouts of certain variational principles and these variational principles typically come up with uh, come up from uh, the conservation principles um, especially of the energy uh, in a in a very uh, rudimentary sense but once you have that variational principle where you know that you have to minimize or maximize a particular integral um, integral because you know uh, these these as point functions and these have to be integrated over the entire volume of a particular structure component in order to arrive at the um, value for the entire component and then you minimize it uh, with respect to the unknown quantities what you end up with is a set of differential equations and boundary conditions um, and for a, a dynamic problem the initial conditions as well and then you solve this uh, boundary value problem or boundary initial value problem um, uh, to arrive at the solution but the whole advantage is you have everything in a single entity which is that particular variational principle and that's uh, the beauty of it but what happens with uh, the conventional variational principle approach is that it becomes too complicated when you're dealing with um, the actual physics uh, with uh, minimal assumptions the differential equations uh, set of differential equations that you arrive at are so complex that um, it's not possible to uh, solve them in many situations at least not in a closed form analytical way uh, there are numerical techniques that you can use to solve but some of them might be uh, substantial taking substantial substantial amount of time. Variational principles guarantee you accuracy to a large extent if done uh, with the right physics, but uh, the computational efficiency is not guaranteed by them. So there was a separate uh, line of mathematics which developed um, not only for structural analysis but for all other uh, problems as well uh, called the asymptotic approach where you had a set of differential equations the newtonian kind of an approach where you um, use vectorial and or tensorial uh, formulations to arrive at a set of equations and then you solve that set of equations by dropping off the higher order terms in those uh, differential equations in other words you compare two terms in a differential equation and say this term is very small compared to this term uh, irrespective of what uh, variations might be there in the unknown and then you drop off that higher order term and solve only with those uh, leading order terms or uh, what we call as the lower order terms we say lower order for the larger terms because the powers are um, uh, uh, lower in that because we are talking of negative powers over there and therefore the negative parts uh, therefore what what we are talking about is in terms of um, a lower order means much larger quantity or leading order term so uh, these two branches of mathematics variational uh, mathematics and asymptotic mathematics developed uh, separately um, uh, the variational guaranteed accuracy the asymptotics guaranteed the accuracy uh, but uh, people were ending up with very accurate uh, models but uh, very difficult to solve and very um, uh, uh, computationally efficient models but still not very accurate why they were not accurate is yes 
uh, if you had a single differential equation then you could drop off the higher order terms and get a very good solution but most problems are governed by a set of differential equations and when you drop off certain higher order terms in one equation uh, it affects the other equations in a uh, way that you uh, can't estimate and the end result is that the accuracy goes for a toss so how do you go about uh, ensuring both uh, efficiency as well as accuracy is where the marrying of these two methods the variational methods and the asymptotic methods came about in the form of variational asymptotic approaches and the first person to introduce that is um, uh, professor berdichevsky uh, that uh, whose name uh, you see over here so uh, professor berdichevsky um, uh, was a Russian uh, who worked, uh, studied and worked in Russia for a long time before uh, moving over to the US. Um, his name also changed, the, the, the double I became a Y. So some of his papers, uh, earlier papers you see with this double I, that is 1979 uh, when he first introduced this particular methodology. Uh, but later on, um, uh, he, he changed his name, the double I to Y. So many of the later papers you would see with that uh, particular name. Um, so he introduced this particular methodology uh, uh, for both shells and plates through two separate papers at that particular point of time. Um, and eventually it's now available in the form of a book, uh, which was actually a Russian book originally. It was translated and upgraded into English um, with a lot more additions uh, uh, in terms of uh, making it uh, much more easier to understand because the original was um, uh, much more abstract. So uh, again, uh, this particular book is available in the library. It's also uh, available at our lab later on when you come over to the campus. So you can uh, look at this particular book um, uh, for those of you who are interested in this methodology. But essentially, it's a powerful mathematical technique to solve such variational problems where you can identify certain small parameters. And almost all engineering problems uh, are uh, such that certain small parameters are possible. And we've already looked that in a semi monocoque construction of an aircraft wing or a fuselage you have a cover skin for example in which um, or the shear web in both of which you have the thickness very small compared to the um, uh, the cord and the uh, span or even if you take a single panel compared to the uh, the in plane dimensions of that panel the thickness is very small similarly when you're talking of a uh, spar or you're talking of a stranger, uh, the cross-sectional dimension of that is uh, very small um, uh, compared to uh, the length of it. So uh, in both those situations, you're seeing that uh, there are certain geometric small parameters which are coming uh, from this um, uh, model. Similarly, in terms of the material parameters, you know that the strain at which a material fails, uh, typically for composites is of, of the order of 1%, uh, so which means it could be up the 2%, 3%, etc. On the other hand, for metals, if you allow it all to go all the way to the ultimate tensile strength, in steels, it could go for 10, 20 percent or more. Um, but still, it's much smaller compared to unity. So the strain itself, a non-dimensional parameter, um, can be thought to be very small compared to unity all the way up to failure. Um, or up to, uh, if it's not up to failure, you're looking at uh, the actual design loads. Up to the design loads, the strains are uh, fairly small. So uh, not only from the geometry of the material, uh, so the geometry of the component, but from the uh, the uh, properties of the material, like the failure strain, etc., there are certain small parameters uh, in a structural problem. Similarly, when you go to, let's say, uh, an aerodynamic problem, uh, let's say the uh, in a low subsonic flow, the Mach number is a small parameter, or um, uh, let's say a, in a, a high Reynolds number flow, the one by Reynolds number is a small parameter. On the other hand, um, uh, very low Reynolds number uh, flow, you can have some other uh, way of uh, um, uh, 
actually looking at the Reynolds number as a ratio with with respect to something else in order to let's say uh, keeping keeping a particular standard of a, another aircraft the Reynolds number as one compared to that aircraft the Reynolds number that this aircraft faces is much smaller compared to unity so there are certain um, uh, numbers non-dimensional numbers or ratios of certain quantities uh, that you can deal with we already uh, also talked about sandwich constructions where foam or honeycomb is used in in between two phase sheets and the phase sheet thickness to the overall thickness is a small parameter the foams uh, stiffness uh, Young's modulus divided by the Young's modulus of the phase sheet is a small parameter uh, similarly the strength ratios etc so these can be used as physical small parameters so essentially uh, all of these um, uh, physics, whether it is in uh, whether it's structural mechanics, or, that is solid mechanics or fluid mechanics, or uh, any other, uh, th let's say thermodynamics, etc. In all of these situations, it is possible from the variational principle to identify purely from the problem definition without making any assumption by looking at the typical structures for which it is applied or typical um, problems for which it is applied you can identify certain small parameters so once you do that now you have a possibility of using both the variational principle and the asymptotic simultaneously unlike the asymptotic approach where the higher order terms were dropped off in the differential equations um, uh, and therefore caused problems in the uh, in the coupled set of equations here the asymptotics are applied at the functional level itself in other words at the strain energy level itself you want to minimize the strain energy so in the strain energy expression which eventually gives rise to uh, the set of differential equation at the strain energy level itself you are dropping off the higher order terms so when you do that what happens is um, there's a consistency that develops in the set of differential equations which come out of it instead of dropping off the higher order terms in the differential equations um, uh, you would drop off the terms at the variational principle which leads to those differential equations so it's a it looks like a very very innocuous very simple uh, change that we are doing uh, but uh, the effect in terms of the improvement in accuracy uh, is much more compared to the traditional asymptotic approaches where you are dropping off the higher order terms in the differential equations so that's the approach um, that these state-of-the-art uh, techniques take uh, so this is just one of those uh, uh, mathematical techniques but the one which makes the biggest impact um I think in the uh, first week of uh, this course, I also talked about many others like nonlinear domain decomposition, concurrent uh, multi-scale modeling, etc., which add further value to this uh, probabilistic or non-deterministic techniques, etc. Uh, but um, essentially, if this were not there, all of those would not have made uh, too much of a difference. This is what uh, makes the overall process so uh, efficient without sacrificing too much of an accuracy and enabling those those uh, improvements to further improve the accuracy uh, going more towards uh, realistic um, modeling. Uh, so here we take, as I said, uh, the benefit of um, the existence of uh, small parameters, for example, in the uh, geometry um, that you see over here, uh, the uh, So uh, uh, geometry, I also give you examples of how it comes from the material properties, in other words, the physics. Uh, so uh, the way this approaches, um, we will, we have, we, it's beyond the scope of this course to describe that. But um, qualitatively, I will describe and uh, I'm sure you'd get a reasonable good understanding of that. Um, one is uh, you do what is known as a preliminary order of magnitude analysis, uh, whereby you're um, estimating the unknowns uh, purely from the uh, physics and the mathematical definition of the problem without having to make these assumptions. So you're letting it to be as high as possible without violating the problem definition most cases it turns out to be smaller than that and therefore you uh, uh, go through an iterative process whereby you make corrections to this method but you initially estimate how large can it uh, uh, be in the worst case scenario for example the strain the worst case scenario it could be 20 30 percent unless you're dealing with um, hyper elastic materials like rubber etc where it goes to uh, as much as 400 500 or even 800 
hundred uh, percent. That is, it basically stretches to eight times its original length. But uh, most uh, components are not using such hyper hyper elastic materials unless you're dealing with, let's say, uh, the uh, let's say airships um, or balloons. Uh, where you're using rubber-like materials which can undergo very large strain and still remain in the elastic regime. Uh, but uh, we have shown that um, we can drop that strain as a small parameter in those cases. In a balloon, the thickness of the balloon is very small compared to its overall dimensions. Similarly, with the airships, uh, as we go for um, more and more complicated uh, aerospace structures like stratospheric airships, uh, which are very different from the low-altitude airships or balloons, uh, hot air balloons. Uh, so uh, the kind of uh, materials that are used there sometimes can still be hyper elastic, you know, undergoing very large strain, but still geometrically there will be certain small parameters. And from the other aspects of the physics of the material, there could be small parameters. As long as you could identify even one or two small parameters associated with this overall model, uh, the, um, the model uh, which is the variational principle based model, then you can apply the variationalism dot method. So uh, to start with, uh, we need to know the orders of magnitude of all the quantities involved. Of course, the known quantities like the material parameters, the uh, geometry of the structure, the, like the thickness, etc. We already know. But there are certain unknowns like the displacement field, if it's a displacement based formulation or the stress field. So we are instead of assuming how it behaves with respect to the thickness, we are saying how large can it uh, eventually go. So that is the um, limits we are setting in terms of the uh, envelope uh, like, for example, we looked at the flight envelope. So we know the largest value of n that it is a particular design can take. Uh, we know the largest velocity that it can take and therefore the dynamic pressures that can come. So using these um, essential aspects um, which are coming purely from the problem definition, we come up with a preliminary order of magnitude estimation of the worst case scenario. And then um, uh, we develop uh, an estimation scheme for the unknowns as well. And um, uh, with that worst case scenario, we go ahead and do the derivation, uh, which is still simpler than doing it with the exact formulation with the, end, the all the terms in the variational principle. So once we do that and get a solution, we get a rough solution, we can now see those unknowns we can solve for uh, because the differential equations are much simpler now. The boundary value problem or initial value problem is much simpler. Once you solve this problem, you uh, end up with uh, what is known as a, a, a preliminary solution, a phantom solution or a zeroth order solution. And then uh, the unknowns are now known. So now you again check with the um, order of magnitude of those unknowns and compare with the orders of magnitude that you had estimated in the worst case scenario. In most situations, it's smaller than that uh, or the same as that. And therefore, if it's smaller than that, you can go even for further simplifications uh, and make it um, even more computationally efficient. So we identify uh, the dominant um, terms which are the leading order terms or lower order terms and the other things which are going to be dropped off namely the higher order uh, contributions um, typically in the strain energy but actually it's in the total potential in the total potential it so happens that in almost all these structures problems the work done uh, turns out to be work done due to the external loads turns out to be a higher order term compared to the uh, strain energy terms and then uh, they drop off and eventually um, it boils down to just uh, minimizing the strain energy rather than the total potential so uh, the specifics of that is again beyond the course those of you are interested uh, we can have a separate discussion later on uh, outside the class but uh, as i said uh, berdichevsky's works are a great reference for that and many other um, people who worked on this after that like hodges and uh, sesnik uh, etc so then uh, what we are uh, doing in the zeroth order approximation, um, as I explained earlier, is uh, we are solving that variational problem, which is simplified version of it, with many of the terms dropped off in the energy. And therefore, uh, you're dealing with only the dominant terms there. Obviously, you're going to get a first cut analysis. And many situations, that first cut analysis itself is very good. So what happens when we apply it to a structure like this pencil, for example, where the cross-sectional dimension is small 
small compared to the length irrespective of what its cross-sectional geometry is um, whether it is thin walled whether it is thick walled whether it is solid hollow um, uh, very complicated structures like airfoil etc basically the problem breaks down into two parts one is a cross-section analysis other is an analysis along the length of the beam whether it's a st statics problem or a dynamics problem but as you go for problems which are um, uh, dynamic problems but higher frequencies or impact like problems then the wavelength is what you need to consider the dominant wavelength rather than the uh, actual length and then the cross-sectional dimension to the um, length uh, is not as small as before but it's still a small parameter so the accuracy uh, drops down but in almost all situations you can go for higher order approximations in order to even in such impact problems or high frequency dynamics problems also you can get a reasonably good uh, uh, approximation with that so what uh, uh, beam theory do you end up with here for the one dimensional problem is the same as the euler bernoulli beam theory so the euler bernoulli beam theory with all of its assumptions that cross section uh, plane cross section remains plane uh, the uh, perpendicular to the uh, cross section remains perpendicular even after deformation that's actually an asymptotically correct theory so when you uh, deal with the variational problem with dominant uh, terms for a beam like structure like this you do end up with the euler bernoulli beam theory itself so you're not making too much of a difference there but at least you are getting the satisfaction that the theory that you've been using the simple engineering beam theory is actually an asymptotically correct theory. What do we mean by an asymptotically correct theory? If there was an exact solution to this problem, then it would asymptotically approach it as the small parameter becomes uh, tends to zero. What is the small parameter here? Cross-sectional dimension or radius of gyration divided by the wavelength of deformation along the length of the beam. So if as, as this small, uh, small parameter tends towards zero in the limit, you would find that uh, the um, uh, Euler Bernoulli beam theory and the uh, exact solution to the theory of elasticity, if it exists, would be identical, one and the same. But what about the next level? Most people um, in structural mechanics are exposed to the Timoshenko theory, the Timoshenko beam theory. The Timoshenko beam theory, though it is so extensively used, we see that in the um, variational asymptotic method, if we go to the next higher order approximation, that is we don't only deal with the, um, the uh, dominant terms alone, but the next level of higher order terms, we are still dropping off many of the higher order terms, but within the higher order terms, which is the dominant term. So we take the next set of dominant terms. The, you have the leading order terms, the next set of dominant terms. So with these two sets, when you do, you end up with what is called as the Timoshenko beam theory. And that Timoshenko beam theory um, uh, is not the same as what Timoshenko derived and what is used uh, unfortunately still uh, in many situations and um, therefore uh, in those cases they need to use a shear correction factor but if you derive this correctly then it will show that you actually don't even need a 6 by 6 uh, matrix for the stiffness. You can deal with just the 4 by 4 matrix. And uh, as long as you make the appropriate um, uh, changes by using the next higher order terms, you don't even need to introduce the shear correction factor, which depends on the shape of the cross section. So the uh, whereas the Euler Bernoulli beam theory is an asymptotically correct theory, the Timoshenko beam theory is not a correct uh, asymptotically correct beam theory and that's why you needed those shear correction factors etc uh, whereas uh, with the asymptotically next higher order theory you can come up with a Timoshenko like beam theory which is uh, far more accurate and uh, is also as computationally efficient as the Timoshenko beam theory. And the advantage, beauty of the variation asymptotic method is you can go to even higher order approximation um, if just for the mathematical kick of it. But uh, from an engineering point of view, you don't really need to do that because you have arrived at something which is so accurate and so computationally efficient that it serves even for detailed design, even for failure analysis uh, in the worst case scenarios like fracture, um, let's say, uh, containment structure which has suffered an impact because of a blade out and it's completely damaged even in such situations we have showcased that it is possible that uh, with uh, just the uh, first order approximation you can get absolutely accurate results which agree not with 
the theory of elasticity because theory of elasticity solutions are not possible in such cases especially with composites etc and the complicated geometries but with experimental results so the next best that we can do is to do experiments and or with flight test data we compare and um, we worked a lot with bell helicopters uh, both in textron um, uh, uh, and both in US as well as in Canada um, and uh, we have uh, showcased for some of their uh, Bell helicopters that uh, with the flight test data we could get a very good uh, comparison of the end results um, as far as damage can go uh, as well so and also with the new innovative designs where we want to uh, postpone delamination uh, by introducing thermoplastic materials uh, for the matrix uh, where we introduced through the thickness stitching or what are um, even better the 3d woven composites where weaving is done in the third direction that is the thickness direction and uh, where nano composites are involved uh, renuka is working on carbon nanotubes for example so introducing those carbon nanotubes or graphene etc in the interface between two layers when we in spite of all of those complications and very complicated geometries it is possible to get accurate results just going to the first order approximation um, so so though from just for the kick of it and for publishing more papers i can go for a second order approximation third order, order approximation etc analytical solutions will become very difficult there but i can always do a numerical solution for that and um, showcase that uh, my uh, accuracy has improved by uh, a few percentage points here and there but uh, it makes no practical uh, utility because um, you do not require that level of engineering accuracy to the uh, fifth or seventh decimal place. So it really doesn't make sense because the input data is not so accurate. The material properties are done through UTS testing, etc. They are known up to a certain level of accuracy. The thickness measurements, etc., are known up to a particular level of accuracy, certain microns. So what is the difference if I have a certain difference in the nanometer level? So it hardly makes any engineering uh, difference. So that's the basic beauty of it um, that uh, we have a methodology which uh, gives you both accuracy and efficiency and therefore uh, the reliability so what we do after we get the zero third order approximation to complete this uh, slide is that we check the results um, at the end of um, not only the zero order but first order etc to compare with the orders of the unknown quantities whether they are uh, same as the estimated order or even higher order than them if they are higher order than what we had estimated we can drop them come up with something which is even simpler and therefore even more computationally efficient still giving the same accuracy but if they turn out, turn out to be lower order that is um, bigger than what you thought they were then obviously you have made a uh, uh, mistake in the worst case uh, estimate um, you didn't take uh, certain uh, further worst case scenarios for example so in such situations you come back and uh, deal with uh, larger um, values for those unknowns uh, in terms of orders of magnitude which means that you have to retain even more terms than what you did uh, in the initial estimate and with those uh, set of terms you come up with a model which is uh, computationally a little less efficient but uh, still uh, much more in accuracy so that's basically what you do so it's a self-correcting process so any mistake that you do it can be self-corrected by the process itself because uh, you estimate uh, based on certain knowledge you have of the physics of the problem what is the worst case scenario but if the worst case scenario turned out to be even worse than that then the method itself has a way of correcting that so uh, so if not we undertake uh, additional steps to get a even higher order approximations so at each step zeroth order first order etc we uh, get asymptotically correct results yes the first order approximation is better than the zeroth order approximation but doesn't mean the zeroth order approximation is asymptotically incorrect at that level it was correct with the higher order terms that we are taking into account the next one is correct and so on and so forth and as i said very very rare cases at least in my research for almost a quarter century now in the variational asymptotic method i have not encountered situations where um, uh, you need anything more than the second order approximation and even the second order approximation is very very rarely needed so all that you need is a zero order approximation which works 
fantastically well for preliminary design um, and uh, many problems of analysis and design. Um, but uh, if you're going detailed design or failure analysis, a first order approximation, nothing more than that. And so, and many of these uh, for uh, simpler geometries are co at the component level, we can get closed form analytical solutions. When you go to more complex geometries like airfoil cross section, etc., finite element method or numerical techniques are used. But the basic building block is still this variational asymptotic process. So uh, there is a, uh, an abbreviation or acronym VAM uh, that is used for the variational asymptotic method. Um, uh, Berdyshevsky himself didn't introduce it, but um, those of us who have been introducing it for various other problems later on uh, brought up with this particular uh, nomenclature, uh, here, starting with his students, and um, we've been using it uh, very, very productively. So for real realistic problems uh, with the industry, we've uh, used these problems, as I said, with Bell helicopters, we've used it with uh, Airbus, We've used it uh, for problems with the Boeing, uh, using smart materials, um, piezo composites in particular. Um, and uh, we worked with HAL, DRDO, ISRO, and um, uh, we've got wonderful results comparing very well with actual flight test data and with the uh, experimental specimen that we have tested in labs at IISC as well as at um, VSSC in ISRO, HAL uh, has done a lot of testing on the health monitoring system systems that we developed for Dro. Um, Bill uh, did a lot of testing at Concordia University in Canada, Montreal, um, using our theory uh, in order to compare with that. Um, See, so one is getting publications out of it, which we have got as well. But at the same time, to actually get the kick of looking at um, it on a flying aircraft uh, like the Dhruv, um, uh, uh, probably, hopefully, avoiding uh, the kind of accidents that it had in its initial phases, that is, is a much more uh, job satisfying um, research that we come out with. And that is possible without an investment of too much of an effort in terms of understanding these new methodologies. But the more critical point is, are we willing to go out of our comfort zones? We have learned certain methodologies. Are we willing to unlearn that and go for newer methodologies, which have uh, shown uh, much more uh, accuracy, much more power, much more uh, computational efficiency? Are we willing to do that? So that um, uh, once that is there to move away from comfort zones, which is much more there in younger people, younger students than in people who have been using it for decades for a very long period of time convincing them is takes much more time but uh, fortunately we've been able to convince people in the industry too which means that um uh, especially for helicopter rotor blades, uh, Bell, Boeing, Airbus, they've all been using this uh, very extensively. Um, and uh, it means that uh, people who are uh, usually kind of reluctant to move away from their traditional methodologies, if they are willing to move, they obviously they see a lot of um, uh, utility in doing so. Uh, and which is why they have made the shift and which is why uh, I'd like, uh, especially those of you who are going to specialize in structures, to um, uh, wet your hands with these kinds of uh, state-of-the-art techniques rather than uh, depending on the strength of materials approaches that you are uh, familiar with, even if it means a little bit of distancing from what you thought was uh, like the Bible or the uh, Quran or the uh, Gita of what um, that was. No, uh, these are bound to change. And will the variational asymptotic method be there for us? And uh, as of now, we think so. But um, uh, you should be open to uh, something even better than this, which comes out. So that has to be the um, uh, a true researcher's bent of mind uh, to um, understand that whatever he or she develops, whatever he or his or her uh, teachers whom uh, they respect so much, they develop uh, and um, many great names like Timoshenko, who what they had, had developed, Reisner and Mindlin, they have done a phenomenal amount of work. Uh, nothing to belittle that. But when we find certain issues with what they have done, uh, the willingness to move away from that uh, has to be there uh, if, if there is an alternate approach, which is better at this point of time. So always being um, at the leading edge, the current state of affairs in terms of the mathematical models, the physical models that are there uh, is what makes um, uh, research so very exciting and the ability to apply that research to actual real life problems. <laughs>
So VAM helps to determine, uh, as I said, two uh, kinds of results. One is the closed form expressions uh, for most problems, uh, including not only the, the passive uh, conventional structures, but smart structures like active structures where we have uh, some of the structural element doubling up as sensors and or actuators. So you have uh, in such situations also, uh, you have the possibility of um, the uh, methodology working uh, in a problem where it's not uh, purely structural mechanics and theory of elasticity but um, the uh, the physics based model is uh, incorporating certain things which are coming from uh, let's say the electromechanics so the electrodynamics plays a role in that uh, or the electromagnetics if a magnetic material is involved over there and many of these actuators are electromagnetic in nature mm, uh, one of your class um, Fanendra is going to be working on stealth technologies where electromagnetics is very important to um, build in materials and or geometries with those stealth kind of materials. So the physics of the problem, the energy that you're minimizing there will no longer just be the strain energy. It will be, a, uh, it will be um, a generalized version of that strain energy with other um, potentials contributing to the total potential, how to minimize that. But essentially the approach or the methodology uh, still remains the same in terms of the mathematical beauty there. Uh, in this context, I would also uh, urge you to attend uh, one of the institute colloquiums that is there uh, this evening, I think around four. If you check your uh, broadcast mains from IIC, you would see that um, at four o'clock we have um, uh, uh, a talk by one of the mathematics professors on uh, Schrodinger's cat and uh, Cauchy's dog. Uh, so a very catchy title there, um, uh, things that I like to use in my own conference talks and um, uh, the journal papers as well but um, essentially uh, these state-of-the-art mathematical techniques though it might seem far-fetched in terms of uh, where they are being currently applied to will always give you ideas on uh, where in your own research problems you could probably apply to uh, many of your mtech students um, you may not be doing research like the phd students but even your mtech project uh, has a huge research content in it and um, in many cases caters to real life uh, industrial problems application so if you can use some of these um, latest mathematical techniques in understanding um, uh, the problem better and pro providing with uh, solutions where uh, problems were unsolvable or uh, better ways of solving it, uh, either increase the accuracy or the efficiency or both. Um, so uh, then you see that the value of these uh, mathematical techniques. So uh, it's always good to take advantage of these um, uh, uh, opportunities that are available. And uh, when you go for uh, more complicated geometries or materials which cannot handle it, for example, we also deal with uh, battery kind of materials, materials which double up as batteries. Battery, um, the same structural material is also a battery. So, or a fiber is a battery by itself. So in such situations, uh, the not only the physics of the problem, but the chemistry of the problem comes in. So the kind of... Um, uh, functional that you have to minimize and the small parameters that you have to identify there involves not only physics but chemistry as well so and in such problems sometimes it gets so complicated that you can't have these closed form analytical solutions anymore but the exact same methodology the variational asymptotic method feeds into a finite element method um, or a finite difference method um, if it's a especially a, a fluid uh, structure interaction problem aeroelasticity kind of problem you can do with a fluid difference uh, the uh, finite difference method fdm as well um, and uh, in all of those uh, kinds of applications uh, the uh, the physics is still there because we started off with a variational principle um, and uh, the uh, accuracy is still there because of the asymptotics involved uh, in that particular problem because of taking advantage of those uh, small parameters and uh, with all kinds of complexity from the material behavior due to anisotropy of the composites, for example, and the multi-physics or multi-science of the battery materials and or sensor actuator uh, kind of structural material, um, smart materials, um, the o, uh, superset of which is the, um, the uh, multifunctional material, of material which performs multiple functions, not only load bearing, all of that can be handled uh, at least in a, a numerical sense if not in an analytical sense.
why do we continue to do a certain analytical model when uh, numerical techniques can be applied everywhere? The, uh, there's a certain beauty to it in the analytical uh, methodology. We enjoy not only the end results, but also the process, which gives us a lot more insight into the problem uh, than uh, pure number crunching. So where it is possible, we always try to stretch the limit as far as the analytical uh, closed form methodology is concerned, uh, because the uh, end results, as, as, as I shall demonstrate uh, when we when I uh, uh, in the next week or so when I give the final results of um, a one dimensional problem like this or a cover skin like shell like problem um, I would show that uh, having closed form analytical solutions how what kind of insight it gives into the problem that's why we stretch the limit for that but we understand that it's not always possible with at least with today's level of mathematics it's not possible to go for uh, closed form solutions for very complex geometries and or um, multiple material distributions where the material behavior is also very complex so there we are willing to go for numerical techniques but still built on the same physics and mathematics foundation so it's not vam versus fem VAM for FEM is what uh, it eventually leads to. Though what most of our uh, students in our lab, for example, work on is uh, VAM based closed form analytical solutions. Um, that's not the only thing that VAM is used for. VAM can be used for numerical techniques. In fact, most of the applications of VAM outside our own lab at IIC has been for numerical techniques, especially the finite element method. So are there any um, doubts? Uh, of course, I didn't introduce any equations and other things on this. But um, as I said, it's applied both for macro and micro mechanic problems. Uh, but if there are any qualitative questions on this, I would be happy to answer. Okay. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, sir uh, yes, Vashish. Hello? Yeah. Am I able? Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Sir, my question is that uh, whenever we uh, uh, derive this strain energy density uh, expression, mm -hmm. which is in terms of only the strain components, mm -hmm. uh, if we uh, take uh, these materials, which are, uh, which are uh, these rubber materials, mm -hmm. I mean hyper elastic materials, yeah. there uh, we cannot uh, ignore these higher order terms. We have to take uh, higher order uh, strain terms. So in doing so, we lost, we lose this quadratic form of strain energy density, right? So uh, we won't be able to have this uh, the reduction from 36 to 21 that we had in uh, uh, this uh, green solid that we will not have, right? So yeah. the uh, C matrix will not be uh, symmetric anymore. So uh, how to deal with? Uh, that kind of situation okay very good question uh, but there are many many levels to your question so it's difficult with just the qualitative um, picture that we have presented to explain everything but uh, i'm still hopeful of giving you a satisfactory answer on this um, uh, we have in fact um, handled hyper elastic materials um, almost 10 to 15 years back um, by one of our uh, former students at our lab um, who is now a professor at Shivnada University, Professor Ramesh Gupta Burela, uh, in terms of hyperelastic materials. Yes, the complications are there in terms of one, you know, as you said, the strains are no longer small, but still the structures has uh, the small parameter coming from, let us say, a cross-sectional dimension to length or the thickness of a shell compared to uh, the other dimensions, in-plane dimensions of the shell. So now we utilize that. The second thing is, so we no longer take strain as a small parameter. We allow the strain to be large or uh, at, um, let's say in an in-between situation, we allow it to be moderate. Instead of 2%, we allow it to be of the order of 20%, let's say. But we know that in reality, it's uh, for rubber-like material, it can go to 400 to 800%. So then we have to completely drop that. So, and uh, the strain energy models that we have, or rather the energy models that we have in those examples are, uh, as you said very rightly, non-quadratic in nature and can involve um, uh, certain complicated uh, uh, formulations. So there are, um, again, very well established uh, theories for that. Many of them developed uh, based on experimental basis, but have given rise to tensorial formulations for the strains and the uh, strain displacement relationship the uh, for the material, the constitutive law, etc. Uh, now, uh, 
uh, whether th- there is a symmetry in the stiffness matrix or not, uh, we already saw um, how that assumption actually came came about in terms of the very existence of the strain energy. It doesn't matter whether that strain energy is quadratic or not because this double derivative of the strain energy with respect to a strain that is dou squared u by where u is the strain energy, the three-dimensional strain energy density, that is energy per unit volume, dou squared u 3d divided by dou epsilon ij, dou epsilon kl, or let's say gamma ij and gamma kl for 3d strains. Now, when the order of the derivative doesn't matter. So whether you take the derivative first with respect to gamma ij and then with respect to gamma kl, or the other way around, you're still going to end up with the same scalar quantity. So which is why that uh, symmetry of the uh, stiffness matrix came about in the 3D. But when we go to 1D or 2D, there is a possibility sometimes we might lose the symmetry, but we can always rework the uh, mathematical model to bring back the symmetry by redefining the strains in a particular way. So there are many uh, aspects of the uh, intermediate mathematical jugglery that we can do without introducing any new assumptions. But it is all something that we can handle. So it's not it's not at all a complicated thing. It is uh, a level of complexity is more than for the uh, regular elastic materials in terms of uh, their behavior. But in going from the 3D to 2D or 1D and ending up with a 1D stiffness matrix or a 2D stiffness matrix, uh, which is no longer having constants um, uh, compared to the original material, uh, the original material in a hyper elastic material like what you explained uh, will have a nonlinearity even in the 3D model because it's having non quadratic terms. If you put it in a force it to be in a quadratic formulation of one half uh, gamma transposed times uh, a stiffness 3D stiffness matrix S3D into gamma, uh, then that gamma, uh, that S matrix, S3D matrix, the stiffness matrix, um, a six by six matrix for a 3D material will be no longer having constants because you have forced it into a quadratic formulation, but you're still having the non-quadratic terms which are going to change the stiffness as the deformation takes place, as the strains becoming larger and larger. But it is still possible to do that. And um, it's not at all necessary to, first of all, force it into a quadratic form. Because we are familiar with that, to have an understanding of what is happening, we might want to look at it that way. But purely from the derivation process and the actual end application, it's never necessary to have it in a quadratic form. All that you need is a variational form. And that variational form need not be quadratic. It can be higher order, um, involving higher order terms as well. And you would still be going through the exact same process that I described in this qualitative slide and you end up with zeroth order approximation, first order approximation, etc. So the, the reason why it doesn't matter is because we are not dealing with vectors and matrices, uh, though we might uh, want to look at it in that form for an intermediate understanding of the process. But the derivation itself is dealing with a scalar quantity, which is the variation, which is the functional whose variational form that we are looking at, minimize it or maximizing it and that irrespective of whether it is a quadratic form a symmetric form a non-symmetric form etc we can always go through this whole process of both the uh, variational calculus of variations as well as the applying the asymptotics in terms of dropping off the higher order terms because we are dealing with a scalar quantity uh, does that answer you Subhashish? Uh, yes sir i got it uh, yeah so one more thing yeah uh, so whenever we uh, talk about some phenomena going on, mm-hmm. we say that some parameter or some quantity is always either minimized or maximized. Yeah. Like for in dynamics, it mm-hmm. is the mm-hmm. kinetic minus potential mm-hmm. energy which is minimized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, in case of light, it is the time tra- time travel which is minimized. Uh-huh. Uh, so, uh, sir, whenever we uh, have some complicated phenomena mm-hmm. uh, where multi physics models are required to mm-hmm. describe the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we know that which particular thing is minimized there? How to come uh, note that minimize yeah. that thing? Yeah, excellent question, excellent question. So this is um, basically derived from basics, basis of physics. So uh, what goes into it is in terms of the material behavior 
certain uh, phys uh, physical uh, uh, observations are made in the experiments etc with specimens made out of that and we understand how it's um, let's say for a structures problem how its uh, behavior uh, changes in terms of the strain versus stress etc which may not be a straight line it's it to be a non linear elastic behavior and um, in some cases not even elastic into a plastic behavior so there we are losing certain aspects of uh, the assumptions that we had encountered but still we have to arrive at uh, uh, what is known as instead of a, a strong formulation a weak formulation for them uh, some of you with um, um, uh, experience in finite elements uh, might have heard of this weak gallerkin formulation etc where we are trying to fit in an um, uh, a formulation uh, a variational formulation where it does not exist for example when damping is there um, whether it's viscous damping or any other form of structural damping that might uh, occur uh, and basically there is no longer a conservation of energy there is an energy dissipation which is happening so how do you bring in those energy dissipation aspects into the variational formulation a correction to the variational formulation is where you go into certain um, uh, a weak formulation is not that essentially but I am saying that something similar to that can be done with respect to the variational formulation but how you come up with that variational uh, formulation itself is in a much more deeper understanding of the physics of that particular problem uh, especially when you go into the multifunctional uh, materials where you're dealing with uh, the electromagnetics and or the chemistry um, uh, the uh, thermodynamics etc they're basically coming from the fundamental uh, governing principles let's say like the um, uh, the laws of thermodynamics etc these are the ones for example even the existence of strain energy when i introduce that assumption i say said that it's basically coming from the thermodynamic principles without going into the details of that so essentially it's those aspects of physics which give rise to a variational formulation uh, it's 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 kind of a parallel methodology that has developed along with uh, let's say methodologies like newtonian mechanics etc where we are trying to deal with vectors force is equal to mass into acceleration is newton's second law essentially where force and acceleration are um vector quantities so uh, the equivalent of that is the law of conservation of momentum so the momenta again is a um, is a vectorial quantity but uh, you can introduce um, uh, the principles of uh, variation based on certain scalar quantities which can be defined based on those uh, uh, quantities like momenta etc so essentially what is um, uh, the uh, strain energy the strain energy is actually coming from strains which are themselves not scalar quantities they are uh, second order tensorial quantities but uh, you are coming up with an energy which is defined in terms of those strains similarly there are things that you can come up in terms of the momenta like the kinetic energy for example can be defined in terms of the uh, velocities and in turn in terms of the uh, momenta that are involved which is both the translational momenta as well as the uh, rotational momenta so you're basically coming up with um, variational principles which uh, have to be uh, corroborated with what is uh, observed in reality either in real life or in uh, lab level experiments so that's again beyond the scope of uh, what we typically do as structural researchers we are taking what the physics physicists develop um, at the current state of the art in the uh, physics uh, modeling uh, and of those kinds of materials a class of materials and then we use that as a starting point for our understanding of the 3d behavior of that material our goal here is to go from that 3d model to a, um, uh, an actual application in a flight vehicle structure for a 2d model for the cover skin and a 1d model for the spar so that movement from 3d to 2d or 1d is what we are accomplishing using the variational asymptotic method the variational principle itself becomes our starting point which have to be given by the physicist but then there is also a catch here in terms of what uh, people like Renuka are doing, uh, working at the micro mechanics level. They are trying to understand it at, from a much more fundamental level or what Vignesh is doing from a molecular dynamics perspective. So here people are trying to understand from a much more uh, lower length scale uh, perspective and um, in some problems we might have to go for lower time scales as well. To understand what is the behavior happening at that particular level again 
uh, there is a certain starting point we have to de de depend upon whether it is a aerospace researcher or uh, any engineering researcher or even a scientific researcher there is a certain datum that we have to uh, start with we are not going uh, to the uh, very um, depth of what is at the beginning so we are taking for granted certain things so it's not it's not that science or engineering has no belief systems in it the very fact that you are giving references at the end of a paper or a book means that you are taking that for granted you are taking that as the starting point Point, assuming that that is true um, and it has worked and therefore that becomes a belief system for you and based on that belief system you are further building how strong is that belief system how strong is that particular approach itself which you have chosen yes uh, there has been so many people who have worked on it who uh, to derive it as well as to apply it and have showed that it works so for that class of problems for which it works that uh, thing that you are going to derive based on that as long as you don't make additional assumptions which are invalid you are going to end up with a result which is going to work for the same class of problems so if you make additional assumptions you are restricting the class of problems further so that's essentially what it is so you can't think of uh, developing the physics as an engineering student uh, yes if you are willing to do that well and good because uh, you do you, these boundaries are kind of fading between science and engineering uh, between the various sciences between the various levels of uh, dep departments of engineering etc which is why we have so much of interdisciplinary studies interdisciplinary research uh, going on etc but uh, you have to draw if you want to make a, a useful contribution you can't be dabbling with everything over there yes you should have an understanding of the bigger picture to understand uh, what each of these contributes towards but somewhere you have to uh, make a line and say yes uh, I believe in these things which have uh, worked for certain things uh, certain problems and that's the class of problems that I am interested in applying so therefore I will take that as the starting point and then develop beyond that so in that sense what you're talking about in terms of the um, the uh, the starting point uh, for rubber like material or hyper elastic material or for a multifunctional material has to be based on what the physicists have developed at, as the state of the art right now so we take that as the starting point and then using that we derive for dimensionally reduced models and in dimensionally reduced models um, to for simplicity i'm talking about only going from 3d to 2d or 1d as a di as a process where you are reducing spatial dimensions but in an abstract uh, problem which is the way we look at it this dimensional reduction can happen at non-spatial dimensions too uh, like physical dimensions uh, or the dimensions associated with the physics of the problem rather than just the uh, geometry of the problem so essentially what dimensional reduction here means is that not not only going from a 3d or to a 2d or 1d problem but basically going for a more from a more complicated model to a simplified model and that simplified model um, obviously is going to be less accurate but the drop in accuracy is not going to be so much it's uh, good enough for engineering purposes engineering applications but you get a huge improvement in co computational efficiency because you have a much simpler model which you can use in a uh, routine or iterative basis so um, so without going to equations i've tried to explain that uh, hopefully it satisfies you subhashish uh, yes uh, it was uh, yeah. uh, understood that, that okay thinking. okay any other questions so i think uh, with this uh, we'll end today's class maybe one more slide just to just for completion sake as an example without uh, spending much too much time on that so this dimensional reduction for a, a beam like structure like this a cross sectional dimension um, is small compared to the overall length so you see that uh, two small parameters have been identified here one is the height to breadth or thickness to width ratio h by b which we are introducing a small parameter delta subscript h uh, so because this thickness h is small compared to uh, this width b uh, so height and breadth um, and similarly uh, so that is not necessary for any any beam but for thin walled beams for uh, whether it's open section or closed section thin walled beams are going to have an additional small parameter which is going to come from this delta h uh, which is equal to h by b which is going to make things um, 
actually simpler in one sense and more complex in another sense. Simpler because you have more small parameters you can drop off for possibly more terms, but those some of those uh, small terms might actually appear in denominators which might make them big and therefore uh, you might ha actually deal with more terms in such thin walled beams than with uh, the thick walled beams and the non-linearities in the geometric uh, sense that is the strain displacement become very very critical and therefore you have a more complex model but uh, nonetheless uh, compared to the 3d model it's still simpler even after taking into account all of these complexities but essentially for a beam uh, irrespective of what the cross section is thin walled or not uh, solid cross sections also you would have the breadth small compared to the length of the beam which is the second small parameter b by l which we are denoting as delta b so using these small parameters it's possible to derive uh, um, a theory even for materials where the strain is not small like the hyperelastic materials and we have already showcased this possibility through a lot of research that we have done in the past but when the strain is also small like the titanium alloys the aluminium alloys and the steel alloys that we looked at uh, at least until they yield and then the composites um, all the way up to their failure the polymer matrix composites in all of those situations we have an additional small parameter that we have which is the order of magnitude of epsilon where epsilon is very small compared to unity where epsilon is the order of magnitude of the failure strain of that material that we are choosing or if it's multiple materials of that material which is having the uh, the lowest uh, strain let us say strain of failure for example if you are using let's say um, let's say steel and um, uh, a particular composite carbon fiber epoxy the carbon fiber epoxy might fi fail at a lower strain compared to the steel uh, so we take the uh, the, uh, the wh whatever is the steel so, the, uh, so which is the larger of the uh, two so that uh, we can deal with those levels of strain as well in that particular uh, part of the material so for example we are dealing with a landing gear design um, uh, and we want to take the tires also into account the tires are made out of a rubber like material which is uh, hyper elastic and then the landing gear system itself is made out of steel which is having um, uh, elastoplastic regime and uh, the non-linear elastic regime beyond the um, uh, non-elastic limit um, up to the yield etc so all of that has to be accounted for it may not be um, uh, uh, to be perfectly plastic it, it is plastic in some other nature and then there is the strain hardening pro, pro, uh, process etc but we are able to take all of that into account as long as you make uh, leeway for what is the level of strain that you are uh, going to so that's the uh, limit on maximum strain but it's not necessary we can completely do away with this and still work only with the geometric uh, small parameters and uh, still lead, uh, deal with a very large class of materials and um, yes it's going to be more complicated in terms of the uh, the derivation and the end results but uh, it is going to be applicable for a larger class of problems so it's all dictated by what is the class of problems that you want to apply your end results to and based on that uh, we uh, come up with uh, various um, uh, models and apply them uh, to various problems so with this i will uh, come to an end of today's class uh, in the next class um, we will uh, look at uh, certain aspects of um, uh, maybe i'll start with the end results of this um, uh, and then uh, we that, that is in thursday's class uh, we will look at certain uh, results from this kind of uh, an approach uh, before venturing into the theory of elasticity in the next class thank you very much Thank you. Thank bye you, bye. Sir. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Most welcome. Thank you, sir. Most welcome. Thank you, sir. 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 तान यज्ञ मयया सर्वा नवयजा
मृत्यवे स्वाहा मृत्यवे स्वाहा